So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our Friday seminars. Today, uh, I'm delighted to present to you Johanna Maya. She's a uh, longtime friend and colleague, both here in the US and Colombia. Uh, Johanna is now an assistant professor in the Department of Supply Chain Management at Iowa State University. Prior to that, she was at Roselia Polytechnic Institute where she did her PhD in transportation engineering, the same uh, group that I was, that I did my work with. Uh, before that, she was at the US where she got a master's in industrial uh, engineering and her background is in industrial engineering from Universidad Norte in Colombia. Uh, Johanna has ample experience in both uh, supply chain, uh, transportation engineering, and also disaster research. And uh, that's gonna be the main topic of today, uh, building trust to enhance preparedness. And she's gonna be telling us about her work uh, with her colleagues from, from Colombia on how people uh, have trust, how the community have trust on organizations uh, doing the preparedness aspects and the capabilities of those organizations. Johanna, I'm really happy you're joining us. I wish you have been here in person, maybe next time. So we are all yours. Hopefully next time. Thank you so much, Miguel, for this uh, nice introduction. So as mentioned, as he mentioned, um, my name is Johanna Maya. I am here in Iowa and um, I work in the College of Business in the Department of Supply Chain Management. And today I'm going to be talking about a work that we have been conducting for, we did the first, uh, the first phase, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. And then uh, we expect to continue on this and um, as we are adding more um, data and collect more data in this topic. So the idea is uh, basically to identify what is needed in order to build trust and then with the main outcome of enhancing preparedness. And this will be at the, com at the community level. So this uh, work was conducted with uh, professors Victor Cantillo and Julian Arellana from Universidad del Norte in Colombia, our alma mater. Um, the way that I'm going to be talking or, or the way that I structure this presentation today, I will talk first about the background on this uh, problem or this situation that we have seen, uh, especially in uh, Latin American countries. Um, also, the modeling framework that we use in order to um, model the data that we wanted to analyze and um, then describe the case study, which was uh, conducted in Colombia. Then uh, talking about the different modeling efforts and the modeling results that we we'll obtain with that and the implications of those findings and how we can actually uh, work towards enhancing preparedness of the community. So let's start a little bit uh, with some background on how this situation is and what are the conditions that are happening. So we know that now more, more, now more than before, disaster impacts are, we can be more aware of those. Every time that we see a new disaster happening, if it is large, all the impacts that we can see, if they are larger than what we had noticed before. And the, the economic damages associated to that is even large, larger. So we need to make sure that uh, we try to find ways to mitigate those impacts. Uh, so the idea is basically in order to mitigate those impacts, we need to be better prepared. So we need to be better prepared to respond and to act as soon as we know that something is coming our way, if it is if possible to be forecasted, or to act once things happen. So we know what has to be done, which is the main effort. Um, so communities are considered a critical responder, and in many cases, it's the very first responder when disasters occur. Uh, we know when something happened to us, we try to get back on our feet as soon as we can, and also try to help our neighbors. And communities actually work on that. We may not be directly impacted, but we try to uh, gather our resources the most that we can, and then try to to, to reach those areas that have been impacted and uh, being able to provide a help and resources uh, for getting back and, and respond and recover. Uh, however, communities are not usually engaged, engaged in the development of the disaster preparedness and response plans, which is kind of uh, odd because we know that communities are there, communities are willing to help, they are the first one to get there to the areas even before the official efforts in many cases, but they are not included in the effort of designing the plans. So what would that be? Uh, how we are helping some uh, individuals or communities without actually getting to know what they feel about 
uh, the, the events or the, or the plans that we are designing. So in, that, in the same line of thought, research has not, be, uh, has not given much attention to this issue that happens on the ground. So we wanted to know, okay, can we change this situation? Is it possible that we can contribute in changing this? So we started exploring a little bit more. So the current situation is that usually organizations developing these plans assume individuals or the communities that are going to be helped as passive receptors of everything that is going to be given to them. So if we consider as an agency that people need to receive this much, or if people need to have these items, they will plan accordingly, and we are assuming as an agency that the individuals will, get, will receive everything that we want to give them, okay, or any service that we want to provide. Uh, and that may not be the case. They might need something else, or they might feel that they could participate in a more active way when these plans are uh, happening or are put in place. So there is no clear idea of what the perceptions of the citizens are with respect, respect to the response system or to the way that the agencies operate or if they feel that they will get the most if something happens when these agencies activate and start working. So the fact that there is no clear perception, we don't know exactly how that perception from the citizens would actually influence their level of preparedness. So we don't know if maybe it, it might be a small, a small event that, that happens and they might be prepared for that. But we don't know even big, small, medium size, we don't know exactly how they uh, would be preparing for potential situations. So knowing those perceptions actually will allow the communities to engage in what they need and they will be able to send that, so to, to provide that feedback to those agencies and then work in a more interactive way. So the interaction between agencies and the community will definitely impact positively the practice on the ground and that will support the efforts on building local capacity, which is the transition that is uh, happening right now in terms of humanitarian operations. It's not only about giving everything, it's more also that we need to make sure that the locals have the capacity to get back on their feet. So we need to enhance resiliency. And that building capacity is what we are aiming right now. So we had kind of a research question that was, okay, what can we actually identify here? So what are the attitudes and perceptions of individuals in disaster, potentially disaster impacted areas or communities? And what are those socioeconomic characteristics as well that can affect the role of trust in the emergency response agencies and risk perception in disaster preparedness? That's the whole package that we wanted to identify and, and study. So we started with some literature and we found some uh, interesting aspects. So most of the studies have concentrated on very few characteristics of the individuals. So if they study, um, let's say gender, they, uh, uh, they do not study education or they study income, they study, this is some specifics. And also they uh, basically concentrate on populations that are either vulnerable or that they are subject to one specific type of risk or disaster. Um, the bulk of research also centers on risk analysis, more like, okay, this is the type of impacts and risks that people are exposed to and uh, what is actually happening, what, what people believe, but they are not translated into disaster management, which is what we're going to do here. And we identified two groups of publications particularly. The first one is basically identifying the role of socioeconomic characteristics on preparedness, and the second one, uh, some of the perceptions that may affect preparedness, so perceptions in different aspects and the operations. So it has been found that education uh, have been previously impacted by the event, uh, employment, age, and having children at home increased preparedness in separate studies. It also has been uh, found that income and gender play different roles in terms of the preparedness and it has been found that it's more related to cultural backgrounds. So they are, they are sending mixed results. And also in terms of risk perception, it says it varies with socioeconomic characteristics, uh, but it may, most of the studies have actually worked on vulnerable communities, females and minority groups. And again, it goes back to having some characteristics as a cultural background. 
One interesting aspect that we found is that being prepared or, be, or having prepared communities is not related with agencies having preparedness and response plans, which is really interesting. So it, it's not just having the plan, it's actually how you make sure that the community gets the information or is engaged in learning and um, basically absorbing what is actually needed to be prepared. So this disconnection is what is actually happening right now. So we don't see what is happening in the middle, that why there is a plan, but the community is not prepared. Uh, also, we found interesting that uh, individuals trust their community in case of something happens, and they trust the, in the agencies only when they are seeing action. So if they have agencies working or organizations working uh, in the in their area and they do not see anything happening that is impacting them they may not they, they the level of trust reduces however they know that if something happened in their surroundings their neighborhoods the neighbors and the the community that they are part of they are actually going to come and help them so we identify a gap that there is a need to understand the aspects that relief agencies should take into account to improve preparedness at the community level. But what are those aspects? So we at the end identified that um, there is a need for uh, designing or outreaching differently among different uh, segments of the population. The method that we use, we analyze empirical data and we identify researching organizational theory to actually enhance preparedness, basically identifying what are those aspects that make the this type of project successful. And uh, we analyze uh, trust, risk perception, and preparedness. So what was the modeling approach that we use? The structural equation modeling. It's very old and it has been used in many different fields. And um, it emerged back in the early 70s. It's a very, it's a multivariate analysis technique and models basically the relationship be between variables with that could be observed or unobserved. And uh, this basically tries to identify or is hypothesized that uh, the, the attitudes and perceptions individuals have on certain situations actually uh, model their behavior and impacts their decision making process. So we identify that there are different uh, variables. That, that we can observe and they are linked to the attitudes and perceptions and we can get a, like a mapping uh, between the causes of those perceptions and um, the different characteristics of the individual. So the attitudes and perception cannot be observed and they are represented as we own something that we call Latin variables or Latin constructs. And uh, they are basically affecting the individual's preferences when they are making the decisions or the choices. Um, we know that we change our attitudes and, and perceptions over time. So we, we get to, to have an idea now, but if we have some experiences and we build that kind of uh, um, knowledge or internal knowledge when we are actually having <clears throat> to make the decisions. And uh, this type of effort is gaining a lot of attention and it's being used widely now more in transportation research, especially when you are looking into decision making process, discrete choice modeling, because um, not always the um, decision maker or the individual is rational. It also has uh, this kind of intricate or, or intrinsic characteristics that actually affect the decision and the choices. And that's why now more hybrid models are being um, developed for analyzing choices made by individuals. So the type of model that we use in this specific um, effort was the MIMIC. It's a multiple indicator, multiple cost model. It has two components. So it basically gives you back two types of uh, two sets of models. One is the structural equation model, the structural model, and the other one is the measurement model. So the structural model is the one that uh, shows how the variables are related to one another and uh, basically shows what is related to the uh, socioeconomic characteristics of the individual, how they impact the Latin variables. And then the measurement model relates the Latin variable what we observe. So basically the exogenous variables that they basically are a collection of answers of perceptions and attitudes that we ask the respondents. And they are usually collected via um, questions in which they have to be in agreement or disagreement or a level of agreement using a Likert scale 
um, when they, they get the options when they are uh, offered these different statements and they get the questions done. So let's go now for, um, to give you an idea of how the case study took place and, and, and what we did in this. Um, first, I want to tell you that this was a project that was like a larger project that included two different types of, of uh, questions. And um, it, it, the data was collected back in 2014 in nine municipalities in Colombia via face-to-face -face interviews. Colombia is a very um, high risk country. We have all kinds of risk at a high level for different disasters that may happen. Starting in 2010, uh, kind of around that, that time, we started having a very strong um, rainy season. We have only two seasons in the country. So the rainy season has become really strong, especially in the northern part of the country, so the Caribbean coast. And um, in that, we, that area, we see a lot of landslides, floods, um, and uh, storms that, happen, that get uh, the area in pretty bad condition. And in this um, type, or in, the, in this study particularly, we collected data in that region and also in the coffee growing region, which is part of the Andes mountain system. So as being part of a mountain system, it has a high risk for um, earthquakes. So not as strong as in California, but we had one uh, back in 1999. And um, not long ago, we had also in the Caribbean coast, there is now a potential risk for tsunamis. So we have kind of a different types of uh, risk that could happen in the country. We selected these two because these events are more, uh, have been more common and they have been actually um, giving us a lot of um, bad impacts uh, when they occur. So these are the nine municipalities that took place is um, Armenia, Barranquilla, Caimito, Campo de la Cruz, Candelaria, Cartagena, Sagún, Santa Lucia, and Swan. We have here one, two, three, four cities. The other ones are small municipalities. And yeah, and um, basically we have people that have been impacted and people that have not been impacted previously by disasters. Uh, one aspect that I was saying, like we have from this major study, there was, um, there were like um, focus groups uh, trying to identify the different aspects and situations that would be um, like being more associated with the, these responders and the disasters, uh, with the respondents and the uh, disaster areas that they are located. Add. And um, also, besides having the questions that I'm going to be showing you, the questions regarding um, what their perceptions and attitudes are towards the system, they also got a question about uh, what would be the selection for um, how to um, how much they would be able to spend in buying water. It was a study for water to define a new deprivation cost function at the moment. And um, that would be basically the other portion of the study that did basically identify what is the willingness to pay in case uh, people have to when they are deprived from such a critical um, item as water. So in total, 560 uh, responses were collected. This is the breakdown from the different uh, locations. And we have kind of 46%, 0.3 were male, 53% were female. We had a pretty good distribution in terms of income level, uh, household size. We have a large um, middle size and low, low, low income size in the country and a very small high, high income level. Um, portion. We also have 63% of, of the people in the sample were impacted previously by an event and 36% uh, they were not. So we identified these as aspects as uh, related to their socioeconomic characteristics. We tested all of them, age, gender, income, occupation, uh, having kids at home, level of education, all these were tested as these variables that would be part of the uh, structural equation model. Um, and then the other questions, the eight questions that I will show you were acting as the indicators that were part of the measurement model. These are the questions that we use for this specific study. 
So there were eight questions. They follow a five level Likert scale and they ask information about the individual preparedness, the risk perception, the level of trust in the system or in the agencies, if they, they consider that they are prepared to be, uh, in case a disaster happen, if they consider that uh, the, the personnel that works on those uh, relief agencies have the, the qualifications to do their job as they are expected, if they have the information and the, the, the knowledge that is needed to be prepared and to act in case a disaster happens. So all these were summarized into eight questions and uh, we use them to establish the observable variables that are part of the uh, measurement model. So we use these answers to identify the attitudes and perceptions towards the system. And these are the eight questions. So the very first one was risk awareness. The second one, management of preparedness information. And they went from none to significantly um, in the Likert scale for the potential answers. So preparation to cope with um, disasters as well. The probability of being impacted if the disaster happens. If they trust in the emergency response agencies. If they trust in their qualifications. And if they are aware of the needs that... Um, emerge in, if something happens. And this is the distribution of the answers. I want to take a, a little bit uh, note on they, the first two kind of even in the, in the answers, three, four, and eight, which are the ones that I want to uh, mention a little bit. So three and four are basically, if we go back here, readiness to act and preparation to cope with disasters. If you notice here, when we look, this is none and this is uh, high significantly, so we see that most of them are not necessarily prepared to uh, work or act uh, if a disaster happens. So most of the individuals do not consider themselves really prepared for something like that. However, if we go back to A, if they know what is actually needed, they, most of them know. However, they do not prepare much, which, is, which I found really interesting because I said, if I know what is needed, why I don't get it, why I'm not prepared for that. So let's go now with the modeling results and see how things, um, how we identify different aspects that we can use in order to enhance uh, preparedness and of course, building trust for these type of responses. So this, we first did an exploratory factor analysis and um, we identify three Latin constructs or factors or that we use as Latin variables. One is preparedness. The other one is level of trust in the agencies or trusting agencies. And the third one is risk perception. The very first one uh, basically describes the attitude towards like taking action, if they will be prepared or not. The second one and the third, so trust and risk perception are more related to perceptions. And uh, the indicators that uh, target preparedness are basically having or managing uh, disaster preparedness information, being ready to act, and uh, being prepared to cope with disasters. Uh, in terms of trust, is basically if they believe or they trust that these agents are going to be doing what they, they are supposed to be doing in case something happens in the community, and also if they believe or they trust in the qualifications of the responders in those agencies. Finally, the last three, uh, the, the ones that target risk perception are if they are aware of the risk in their area, uh, the probability of being impacted if something happens, and the needs awareness. So these three are uh, the ones that, that uh, become the Latin variables, and these are the indicators that, um, that basically show the attitudes and perceptions of the individuals in the community. Don't stress about the figure, I have the tables, but I just wanted to show you graphically how the model happens. This is the best one that we got in terms of uh, statistics of fit. We use log likelihood to identify uh, the best one. And uh, we got pretty good statistics on that. Uh, the lowest level of confidence for the variables that are significant is 90%. And I will go over those uh, variables and, and, and what they mean. But what we, we wanted to show you is that we have a set of uh, observable variables that we are the ones on um, the left-hand side, again in gray. We have these variables that impact trust, preparedness, risk perception, and we also see that it's a relation between the Latin variables themselves. So we have an impact, a positive impact. If I trust the most, I prepare the most, which is kind of intuitive because if I trust that they're going to do their job, if I trust that the agents are going to be 
working as they're supposed to, I may think that I would prepare less, but no, the more I trust, the more I prepare because I know exactly what's, what's, what has to be done. And in terms of risk perception, it is basically what we were expecting. The higher the risk perception, the higher the preparedness. I know what may happen here in Iowa. For example, I'm not expecting a hurricane, but I may get impacted by a tornado. So I need to know what my risk is and how I can prepare for that. So here, I think you will be able to see better uh, what are these, uh, the these different relationships. So we have on the left-hand side, we have a table with the structural equations model, and on the right-hand side, the measurement model. The measurement model is basically the reflection of what I showed you before on the um, factor analysis. What we did is basically identify the significance of these uh, indicators on preparedness, trust, and risk perception. We have all those, just two are below 60%. And so they are basically uh, really good in terms of describing these um, Latin constructs or Latin variables. Um, when we start looking at the regressions on the structural equation model, that's when we start seeing like, okay, we have some variables that actually impact more than one Latin variable. And uh, we test for mediation in order to see what is the total effect of those variables. So let's start with trust. Okay, so when we have to, what are the characteristics of the population that trust in the agencies? So we see, okay, if I have been previously impacted, then I believe or I trust more in the, uh, the work that this uh, agency is gonna be doing. Uh, so basically I know what, what may happen because I already lived that situation. So I, I, I know I can uh, see if, I, if they would do their job. If I have a college degree, though, I try, I tend to trust less, which is kind of interesting. In the same way, if an individual belongs to a low income community, they tend to trust less. And we have, and, and the same happens with medium income, and that is compared to high, high, high income levels. In Colombia, we have the kind of, um, and that's more in the cultural background, we have this situation in which uh, many things actually are related to politics. So having a low income community, usually they are the ones that get targeted first when these kind of uh, promises and all those things happen. So the trust for these communities is very low in general for different things. So um, they trust their community, but they do, may not trust externals. And that's what's actually reflected here. Uh, if you have uh, availability of the contact information of those entities and you need to actually reach out when something happens, then your level of trust increases as well. So having or being, that, that actually gives you a sense of security that if you have this information, you will be able to act upon something. Um, in terms of risk perception, individuals that are older than 50 years old tend to be less aware of the risks or their surroundings. Why it might be that if you didn't experience uh, kind of bad things when you were younger or, or as you age, you become more, let's say, savvy or more wise. Um, so you start to being overconfident that nothing is going to happen or you may be absent-minded of what's actually going on around you. However, the, the confidence for this is uh, 90%. Uh, being previously impacted definitely increases risk perception, and that's something important that we need to keep in mind. Previously impacted is a variable, variable that actually um, put perspective in the ways that people actually act in case of disasters. And females. Females is a very interesting situation here, and as I showed you at the beginning, we have seen different um, mixed results for females. So what happened with females here is that females are aware of the risks, so they have higher risk perception. However, when we go to preparedness, we see a negative sign in their, um, in their significant, in the, in the coefficient. So what happens here is that females tend to be aware of what's going on, however, they prepare less. Why women would prepare less? Well, it's a combination of things. It might be that they do not have, <clears throat> they are not the ones to make the decisions at home. It might be that they are not uh, receiving um, the resources or the education needed to actually be, be having access to those resources to making the decisions and to be prepared for, for different aspects. 
However, when we combine female with having children at home, their preparedness increases. So we are thinking that uh, what is actually capturing the role of women as part of a household is that they get prepared only when there are children living at home, not necessarily when they are not uh, the same mothers in the household. Um, what are the, the, the variables that actually impact preparedness? Where well, we say having elementary education only or at most elementary education reduces the level of preparedness. So now we start identifying that what are those um, segments of the population that we have to reach out in order to increase preparedness in the city, in the, in the community. Uh, being previously impacted increases preparedness. So we have to reach out those areas that actually have not been impacted to avoid being overconfident that they will never be impacted. Because we have to remember um, disasters are social equalizers. So you may have high income level, but if disaster happens, we all will be having, we'll be living in the same conditions or most of the, most of the population will be in the same conditions. Having a college degree increases preparedness, medium income level as well. Um, I already mentioned the fact of having children at home, having a first aid kit or a preparedness kit to or, or um, ready to add kit at home also increases preparedness and um, getting the content information that I was mentioning before. Now, one aspect that we um, identify is the positive relation between trust and preparedness and risk perception and preparedness. As I said before, the more I trust, the more I know exactly what, uh, what is needed, so I prepare for it and the way that we act. So we, as I mentioned before, we identified three key variables that we needed to test for mediation. Um, and they were college degree, female, and previously impacted. So we wanted to identify if, for example, trust mediates between college degree and preparedness, risk perception between female and preparedness, and trusting agencies and risk perception between being previously impacted and preparedness. And in this, we have found that the fact that all confidence intervals do not have the zero in it, then all test and mediators actually mediate between the variable that the independent variable X and the dependent variable Y. So what we found then is like the indirect effect of, co effect of college degree is negative on preparedness. The indirect effect of female uh, on preparedness is positive and for previously impacted is also positive. So when we start identifying the total effect of the different variables on preparedness, we identify that the total effect of college degree and previously impacted on preparedness is positive. Therefore, having a college degree and having previously impacted increases preparedness. However, the total effect of female on preparedness is negative. So this confirms that females do not actually prepare, even though they may have higher risk perception. So what are the implications of all these aspects that we identify? So first, um, we start thinking, okay, we are identifying that we need to enhance preparedness. We need to, for this to be successful at the local level and the community. And we have two different organizations or entities working on. So the agencies or the response systems and the community. So we need to make sure that they partner in order to enhance the trust between them and uh, in, in consequence, the community prepares. So in order for this project to be successful, we need the trust to increase. So trust is needed. We know community needs to trust the relief agencies. So how we make sure that they actually trust them. So trust increases when those serve, they say the community have information at hand, information of contact information, information of knowledge of actions that had to be taken or what has to be done, evacuation routes, understanding of their role when something happens. That is the type of information that more often than not communities do not have. And that's why there is a need for the organizations or the system to actually transmit the information that they need, the community needs to respond. Moreover, not only transmit, because we need engagement, we need communication. So we need programs that actually includes the community when this information is developed or designed. So they know exactly, okay, I was taken into account when we 
uh, when these these programs were designed or these plans were designed, so we'd be able to act upon it. And that would actually enhance the way that they see each other, especially the community seeing the agencies. So the agencies need to transmit confidence with effective communication and clear paths to engage. Engage before. Engage before the events happen. Engage, engage before the whole plan is laid out. So they feel that they are more accounted and they feel that they, the community feels that they, their voice actually is heard. Uh, plans uh, to enhance preparedness must be disseminated differently among the population segments. Uh, use diverse technologies depending on the different generations. We cannot use the same technologies and programs to reach out the older population, the ones that are uh, more than 50, compared to the ones that are uh, in their 20s or the younger kids that are at home. So we need to identify, we need to identify the appropriate technologies to reach out to them. Uh, develop, for example, with social media and social networks and platforms, what are the kind of messages that we should be using in order to reach out as, uh, to, to these types of segments. Um, develop programs to target individuals with low education levels, okay? Those who have elementary school, we know that they do not prepare or they prepare less compared to the others. How can we get to those uh, individuals? Make sure that they are integrated into the outreach effort. More now than before, target women with specific programs. So having women part of uh, different outreach, outreach or implementation programs that take their voice in a different way. So for example, uh, we know that they are aware of what's going on around, but they, they do not prepare as we would expect it. So how we can develop some programs in which only women are included. Um, try to identify programs in which they feel empowered. And with that, they will get to know more and they will have access to additional resources to prepare. Um, also make sure that non-impacted communities have a good understanding of what to do in case of. So they might, they, we need to remove that feeling of overconfidence on what, if they will not get impacted ever, ever, never, ever, then they need to know still what's, what to happen, what to do. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, also only high income individuals trust in the system. So there is a need to reach out to the other income levels. If we do it through the educational levels, because there's a relation between income and education, then we may cover a little bit about that. But we need to make sure that we are covering different uh, um, strata or uh, income segments. Um, reaching out to adults that are older than 50 years old and uh, make sure that they are aware of what's, what's going on in their areas. So to close, um, we, I, I just presented and given an overview of what, what a research was done in order to increase uh, preparedness towards building trust between organizations or, or relief organizations or agencies and uh, communities. Uh, so agencies need to collaborate with the community to improve their preparedness. Having a good plan does not mean the community is prepared, and that's what, uh, what has been found before empirically. Uh, engaging community leaders with open doors to disseminate plans in a better way. I have witnessed this um, last summer. I was in Colombia conducting some focus groups, and it's amazing the level of uh, trust community leaders have. So if it is... I mean, the person that goes and, and, and uh, knock the doors and is the person that gets to hear what's going on with your family, it's considered a friend, it's considered somebody that is going to be helping them. So the community leaders actually open doors to these organizations in order to uh, get to the, to the community. Effective communication lead to trust in the agencies. And we consider that further research is needed to develop outreach programs that are tailored to these population segments. Um, we also consider that in order to assess transferability, we need to make sure that we collected data in other areas. We actually did that and we are in the process of um, analyzing it. Uh, in a different country with a different uh, setting, we collected data in Ecuador for that and we're expecting to identify what what holds in this study in Colombia actually holds in Ecuador and what are the differences between the two. And with that, I would say thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Johanna. Let me open the, lost my participant list. There is a person that raised a hand. So Kira, go ahead. 
Yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you made that analysis in Columbia, uh, the dimension. So, uh, do you think that effect of female or elderly people or get informed is kind of a global assessment uh, that can be applied to other countries or cultures or depending on each country's cultures, quantities, social quantities? Okay, yes. Um, the, the, the variable of gender has been assessing other countries and it has been moved from one to the other one. So I think gender is one of the type of variables that we can actually uh, generalize or transfer directly unless we know for sure that there are specific characteristics that, 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 that are uh, comparable between the different countries. Um, especially because in, at, at least in developing countries, there is a mix of what is the role of women in the society. So some women are more liberated, some are more like leaders, others are more like they stay in the back, they are devoted to specific tasks in the society, and they basically try to uh, meet those uh, expectations instead of just being forward thinkers or leaders in different aspects. So I believe um, we can compare between or among different countries with similar characteristics and we cannot transfer directly these ones. That's what I said at the end that I, we, we are basically collecting more data on other countries to see if we can at least, at least in Latin America, we can have some idea of what's the impacts of the, what, what, what holds on different countries in the same, at least the same economy that, as Latin America. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I think you had a question. Hi, Joanna. Hey, Hope you're doing you? well. Uh, yep. Fine, thank you. Uh, Joanna, I would like to know if if you expect any significant difference with the pandemic situation by this one? Well, the pandemics is definitely a whole new world. So, um, being prepared for a pandemic is basically stay at home. <laughs> so, but in this case, um, we can, I mean, we, what we tested here is being prepared for action that people actually will go out and help others, right? Uh, in the case of the pandemic, definitely I have not um, identified anything that would be directly transferred um, because it would be more into what are the, the conditions at those community at the level of the community that, that would that would allow people to take action um, if we see and we notice different uh, relief organizations or agencies that are what are they are doing right now with with uh, COVID-19 is that basically they are trying to reduce the the number of programs that they have and trying to go as like if they are were going before 10 times in a month now they are going five so they are reducing by providing more but in less number of times so the fact that this is a slow process remember the pandemics is basically a slow moving disaster something like that so we cannot just like assume that this is these are actions that are going to be uh, happening in a short period of time so the model when we design and we designed the questions about it it was basically for people helping themselves and then being able to successfully prepare for something that is not going to last like a month two months that we are seeing with this pandemic johanna in the same in the same line when you were doing or you are still doing the analysis have you gotten any responses that are more related to uh, the response phase and not only kind of preparedness um, in terms of uh, what the community feels when they are they are receiving the the help or the aid from the agencies yeah yeah well we in, in, a, in a as part of these kind of additional uh, questionnaires that we are developing we got information regarding we ask who they feel in this new stage who they feel will actually help them mm -hmm. and they do not trust agencies as much as the local leader and the religious leaders. So they feel that they would get more help and faster from the neighbors or the, the community leader in the area where they live, where they are located, and the religious leader 
that they are associated to. So if they are uh, the pastor, the priest, whoever the, the leader in that religion that they actually belong to or participate, they feel that those two are the ones that are going to be helping them way more and faster than the uh, agency. And then after that, the politicians. So we asked about different, different types of uh, people that will actually help them. And those two came before the official ones, which is kind of interesting, seeing that they, 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 they trust more the society than the, the system itself. Okay, and before we go to Carlos, one, one follow up. Back in 2014 and 15, I did uh, interviews in, in, in the Atlantic State in many municipalities. And based on, on Regulation 1624 from the National um, System for Risk Management and Disaster Response, as you mentioned, communities in Colombia are actors, should be active actors in the response itself. However, when we were doing the interviews, the community first didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. So they were always expecting somebody to help them. So there was no inner preparedness. Have you seen something uh, changing now? Do, do people feel that they need to to prepare and not always wait for an external agent to help them? Yes, so we asked that kind of question, how they actually prioritize, how to, help, like how to be prepared and if they actually prepare for things. So we are in the process of analyzing that. We haven't gotten any specific models yet for this, um, but we are basically trying to identify if they actually prioritize helping, like preparing themselves instead of just waiting for something to happen and somebody to come and help them. So we will see, we, we, will, uh, we have new data for both Ecuador and Colombia. So that's the one that we are processing right now. Okay, thanks. Carlos? Hey, Ivana, so nice Hi. to see you. Hi. So a quick question. Um, so I guess in somehow we can measure like the effectiveness of attending a, a disaster, like these kind of disasters you are talking about. So, so in what, what is then the preparedness of any disaster or this kind of disaster can impact the quality of the attention of, or the support of the disaster? Because I guess there are more factors behind, uh, behind like how good is gonna be the, the support. Okay, so if I let, let me re rephrase what you asked and see if I understood correctly. So, what would be the impact of being prepared in terms of the response itself as a whole? Yeah, so because I guess there are many other factors more than being ready for the disaster or any disaster happening. Yeah, so well, we haven't measured that, but one of the things that come to mind right now is like, okay, if you are prepared, the, the, the way or the road to go back to on your feet, it will be faster and less painful. So for example, let's say, let's take it now on um, the, let's say there's an earthquake that happens and or a disaster that happens right now, and we are having uh, the information and knowledge on what should be done in order to, um, I, what is actually my, my place, my role, what I have to do, where I have to go, what are the actions that have to be. I will minimize my losses if I know the information, if I actually will be able to, to uh, take action on that. I will also be reducing the level of impact of those. I will be able to actually help others in the way when we are actually trying to get it to a safe place, for example. But also we will make the, the work of the, the agencies or the, the relief effort easier because basically they will be able to work with people that know what's going to happen, that have at least a sense or an idea of what is what has to be done most of the of the actions that the relief organizations or the agencies do basically is educating people you should do this you should do that let's try to do this beyond just offering resources like food or medicines or things like that is actually telling them okay now you have to do this or that uh, we recommend you to stay at home or we recommend you to go to a shelter it's not safe to stay here we can see if uh, may other waves are coming or there is a flood in this way or that way so i think beyond just having the resources in terms of aid, we will be able to help the system to do it in a faster and more efficient way, just because they will be dealing with people that know what they're talking about, not just like being absent-minded that have no idea what's going on. 
Okay, but um, let me ask you again. So, mm-hmm. but I don't know, like there are like models for that, like that actually have been proved like different preparedness strategies. Oh, the, to, to the best of my knowledge, no. Okay. But it would be good, like something that like, could be expanded, like, okay, now that we have these, how we measure the impact. Though I don't know if we would be able to measure it. Um, I guess it would have to be done in right when a disaster happens because you need to know like if you if your community is prepared then you have to identify what happened how it happened and then if actually that those preparedness tasks that were done before actually work and that in association with resiliency measures that's something that we can actually that could be explored as well okay thank you johanna Mm -hmm. any other question Okay, I'll throw an, another one there. Um, in the analysis you have been doing in, in, in Colombia and our developing countries, and also looking into uh, similar cases in, in the US, when we talk about community resilience and we focus on probably just trying to, to satisfy uh, basic needs, right? Uh, we're expecting people, depending on the disaster, depending on the risk and threats of the location where you are, if we are in a in a tornado, hurricane, or earthquake um, area, our needs will be different because the impact will be potentially different. But overall, uh, when we're looking into into kind of um, disasters, especially natural disasters, we need to have supplies uh, at, in our location of, of safe or safe locations. However, when when we look into the economic conditions of many populations throughout the world. And especially, there is some sort of correlation between people at risk and lower incomes mm-hmm. in, many, in many countries. So how do we make good preparedness plans when we cannot expect people to have this additional spare food uh, just lying, laying there for uh, when the disaster happens, when they are living in a uh, day by day or they, they may not have even enough uh, supplies to to satisfy their needs in a, in the regular cases. What have you found when you make you you ask people about their preparedness, especially in countries by different type of uh, levels of income? What, what is the perception regarding preparedness? Well, um, as of what what we have done before, because we we asked that question in. Um, in the, in the new wave of surveys before for them be prepared is basically having a first aid kit and also having some um, extra information of who to contact, where to go and things like that. So that was the, the idea of preparedness. In the new one, we ask if they consider it's more important to have like a cash or has a, a, some sort of uh, food supplies or things that um that are more like for use when the thing happened for whatever the disaster is so we have not seen that analyze analysis yet but um one of the of the of the new trends in terms of research for okay people do not have those things and as an agency or as an organization we one build local capacity but two we also need to have somehow the pre-positioning happening for the response. And the, what is actually happening now is that they are making sure that these low income communities or vulnerable communities have the supplies pre-positioned closer to them. So they are, it's not just having it in a safe place where it's not gonna be impacted, it's actually having something in those areas where the impact is gonna happen. Just because these will be making the operation easier or faster at least to get a hold of some resources at the beginning if people do not have because they live on a day by day and everything gets destructed or something like that but that's that's a new trend in terms of the prepositioning and the whole from the perspective of the organizations from the perspective of the of the of the community itself it's really hard i mean how you can make sure that people have something if they don't even have their the, the food for tomorrow for example so how you can actually make sure that they reserve something for an event that it may or may not happen, but if it happens, it's going to be useful for them. So it requires more than just 
educating people. It requires a lot of effort because it's a, it's a, there is a direct connection between ha being vulnerable, being at risk, and also ha not having money or not having the economic resources to sustain themselves. So that's a very interesting question that, that we, I don't know how to, how to, we can develop something or a plan to associate those two things. I think there is a point in which the official effort, the official response, the response or system is the one that has to take care of those that are at the extreme level. But we need to also make sure that they, there is some sort of education to those I mean, if we go back to in Colombia right now, we are having pretty bad in the coast with the level of impacts of COVID-19, just because people need to go out to make something for their food for today or tomorrow. So it is making the situation worse. And they are not stopping because basically they do not have ways to sustain themselves. Even if the, the government or the, the, the official uh, system does something for them is not sustainable in the in the long run so there is there is a lot that has to be done in that aspect okay thank you any questions any anybody else okay i'll throw another question there <laughs> my goodness me it's full of questions today um I mean, we're we're all going through COVID nineteen, and let's forget about Colombia, mm -hmm. and, and we are in the U.S. And there may be people that feel that either the government, either the federal or or regional or state levels are not doing the appropriate measures. Um, from the research you have done, from all the potential things that affect trust, what will be key recommendation for our uh, high officials or, or governmental officials at different levels to develop these either response uh, policies or response policies that are actually preparedness policy for the next wave of the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. What will be the best recommendation that you will give them to, to have uh, a message that is meaningful to the population? But the message is for the policies for the politicians, right? Not for the population. No, no, it's what, what would you say the politicians okay. that they need to do based on what you know from, from the, the trust people. from the people, yeah. So one thing that, and I'm gonna tell you just because I'm in Ames, Iowa and where not, not much is going on, but there is a lot of complaints. So um, do not treat people the same. So there are, even in the US, there are different segments of population that are being impacted Diff way be way more than others. So having information on the different levels of population, the different um, segments of population, and also on the ways that economic impacts are getting to them. Um, it's actually something that needs to happen before they start doing the whole releasing the, the, the stimulus checks and all those things. We're having, we're seeing that um, these, um, if, if I want the, the people to trust in the system or in the way that it's actually happening, it should not be a single policy that covering every single person in the community. That's something that I would definitely tell them, like we need to break them down because we'll, they are, there are some that are more vulnerable to others. There are low income, but there are different levels of low income that actually getting impacted differently. There are people that have been uh, laid off because they, they, they made their way of living um, on a number of hours that were accumulated between different jobs. And let's say three out of the four jobs, they got canceled. Or uh, people that were having this situation in which they're getting aid from the government and they're making something additional in addition to that, and now only the aid from the government is the one that is coming. That additional portion is not not having the way to them. So I think um, sending the message that cases or, or different policies are implemented based on situations or based on uh, different characteristics it would actually give them some peace of mind. Uh, some of the aspects that people here have been complaining about is like, everything is about the uh, economy. Nothing is about the people. So why they are feeling this way? Because they feel that it is too, um, 
you say um, far, it's too early to start opening the, the state, for example, here, that they start the opening at the beginning of May, even though when we had, we were at the beginning of the, the peak of the, of the cases. And uh, the perception of the large majority is basically these, these uh, measures were taken, were, were taken very, in a very, in a, not in an informed way. So they basically were feeling that it is not about them, the, the community or the population, it's about the, the economy. Um, here, the state have been impacted significantly, especially because this is a center of the food supply chain. And the processing plants, for example, for meat processing plants are considered essential um, infrastructure and they cannot close. Then you see at least three plants in the, in the state have been uh, uh, hotspots for outbreaks because um, employees have to keep working, they do not have the conditions for ensuring social distancing, and they need to continue doing their job no matter what. And they don't have it, they are, they are not even protected, so they cannot not file suits for the, for the employer to make them work in, if they are concerned for that. So thinking about the people, not just thinking about some metrics that are related to, uh, we need to maintain this number of um, jobs so or we need to maintain this number or this uh, income level or things like that i think it's more thinking about people instead of just thinking about check marks that are related to some economic indices thank you we have a question from sean a question from sean yeah well first off thank you joanna for your presentation um my question kind of relates to uh preparedness and uh specifically like between kind of urban and rural communities um, I don't really know so much how it's kind of separated in like the municipalities you looked at in Colombia, but um, you know, in the U.S. it's at least where in the West it's, you know, very separated. You have like the urban and rural is kind of the culture and kind of I think the kind of oversight's a little bit different, the structure than, you know, the cities. So I'm just wondering like in your analysis, um, have you noticed big differences in terms of preparedness uh, between you know the people that have been affected or have not been affected um, kind of how are those uh, differences that you've seen how they played out uh, we didn't I mean we didn't see any significant differences between being in a uh, urban area compared to the small municipalities but um, we definitely saw difference for those that were impacted versus not impacted so that is the only one that we saw and, and if they they were impacted before the main um the main aspect for them is like we know that we cannot repeat the same mistakes that happened before so they uh implemented like having this information contact information uh, evacuation routes all those that would help them um be ready in, in case something happened and that was the main difference that we saw we didn't see much difference between urban and rural, um, but we may say that the infrastructure that is available in our rural in, in our municipalities in the rural areas is not as good as in the city. So I would say that they they will feel that prepare. For example, being from the city, let's say Cartagena, Barranquilla, being prepared in the city is like okay. I know I have these kind of things here and there. And usually if you live in the city, you have a better awareness of what's going on. And usually, at least in, uh, in Colombia, our cities are not as heavily impacted by disasters. Usually are the rural communities the one that get the most impacted. But we didn't, it, like it actually did any modeling related or differentiating for rural versus urban. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Well, if not, Johanna, thank you so much. It was very thank interesting. You. Thank you so much for, um, for the invitation. And uh, um, yeah, so I, you have my email address. If anyone has any follow-ups or questions, uh, mm -hmm. just send me an email and I will be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Johanna, be safe. Thank you, you too. Thank have you. a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.